thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bitten. It's uh, very in, uh, exciting for me to be on this platform, or I guess you wouldn't really call this a platform with you, way down in the pits here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, uh, great for me, a very, uh, in all candor, to be thinking about the fact that I'm going home tomorrow. And um, uh, I am so sorry to hear about your snowstorm that's coming in. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I feel a little bit like Hezekiah, you know, when he heard about all the terrible things that were going to happen after he was finished as the king of Israel or of Judah. And he said, well, at least it won't happen in my reign. And uh, <laughs> I'm just glad that this storm that you're getting will be happening when I'm gone. And I, I hope you all do enjoy it. And uh, I'm <laughs> sure that we will be getting our share, too, in Chicago. I, before I begin, I would like to express deep appreciation to the uh, college here for the very splendid accommodations that they have given to me, that you have given to me, to all those who uh, were involved in arrangements. Gordon Sutherland was uh, one of my drivers, and Jim Reno was another one, and I, Rhino, excuse me, and I uh, appreciate what they've done and others in taking me around and making sure my seat belts were fastened and uh, <laughs> I wasn't pulled over by the local constabulary for breaking the law. And uh, it's just been a delight, really, to get to know this part of Canada. About 20% of our church is in Canada, and I spend a lot of time, actually, in Canada. I have two sisters who have defected from our family and are Canadian <laughs> citizens, and they, uh, we visit them still. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> occasionally they visit us, but um, we do get here, but it's not very often that we get to this part of Canada, and it's such an unusually delightful part of your country, and I was talking to my wife last evening on the phone, and we agreed together that we most certainly would have to come back here sometime when the weather is a little bit less inclement than it is, but in the summer we would really like to see this area. It's just beautiful. So we do appreciate, I do appreciate this opportunity I've been given, and I do want to thank the Divinity College for honoring me by asking me to be a part of this lecture series. I have looked at some of the other names that have been involved in this series, and I certainly am honored to be a part of that very distinguished group of people who have spoken here on preaching. I would also like to say that uh, I am awed by the people that I have talked with and have come to know, at least in some degree, while I was here. I might just say that work like mine is a relatively strange ministry from certain perspectives so far as Christian ministry is concerned. And in the nature of the case, we are forced, those of us who are involved in broadcasting are, are somewhat forced to live in a measure of isolation from other ministries in the church where we are simply called on to day after day be involved in the matter of program preparation, which involves its own particular discipline. And it's been so refreshing for me to be able to converse with many of you about subjects of great seriousness that have engaged your attention and do engage mine as well. But just to feel again, you know, I, I really do feel that it's important that the church use the electronic media. I don't think there's any other way for us as a Christian community in North America and within the world to reach some of the large concentrations of population in the world today. And many of these people are in national circumstances where it's impossible to reach them by means of conventional missions because missionaries are not allowed in these countries and uh, consequently we have a high degree of enthusiasm those of us who work at the back to god hour because of the work that we're doing i think of the work of reverend madney for example he's our arabic speaking pastor and he's reaching a part of the world where it's very difficult to penetrate by means of conventional missions but in the nature of the case, you see, sometimes you, 
began, you, you start forgetting that there are people like you out there who week in, week out, day in, day out, are giving of yourself to the great work of Christ. And it's been so good to realize that we all have our part, we all have our role, we of ours, we're basically, in a sense, just street corner preachers, really. When you get involved in broadcasting, you, you sometimes sit back and say, well, really, that's all I'm doing is standing on a street corner and preaching to people. And we are necessary to people in our work, but we are certainly just a little part of what God, God is doing. And, and I have felt some of the grandeur of his work simply by being among you. And I do want to honor all of you who are here involved in the regular ministry of the gospel because I must confess I don't see how you do it sometimes because you are on call 24 hours of every day, seven days a week, many of you, and the, the efforts that are expected of you are enormous. And it's a privilege to be in the fellowship of people like yourselves and your wives and others who are preparing for the ministry. I consider this week a high point in my life, just in terms of the opportunity it's given me to feel the pulse beat of the Church of Our Savior. Now this evening, we're going to continue to talk about the ethics of preaching, and I would like in doing that to read a few verses as I begin from the ninth chapter of First Corinthians, where I'm going to break in at the middle of the twelfth verse, a verse, interestingly, which is broken in half by a paragraph division in 1 Corinthians 9, and I think that it will provide a context for what we will be thinking about this evening. The Apostle Paul has been talking about some of his rights as a minister, namely his right to be supported by the people to whom he preached, and then he goes on and he makes some very striking remarks about the ministry of the gospel. He says, we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar in the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel? But I have not used any of these rites and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward if not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge and do not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone I win to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all means possible, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore. I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. 
And with these words, it seems to me the Apostle Paul makes very clear that those involved in the preaching ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ are under obligation to live a life of discipline, self-discipline, personal discipline. This evening we're talking about that context which involves our own persons. We have talked about others which impinge upon us as we conduct our ministries. We have talked about the broadest context of all, the great forces within our society. We have talked about cultural context and the ecclesiastical context, but with all of these, possibly that which affects whether or not we will conduct our preaching ministry with ethical, in a proper way, ethically, there is ourselves and who we are, because we bring to the ministry these persons whom we are, with our foibles, with our strengths, which we prefer to talk about, and there are some, but not only with them, but we bring everything that we are. Those tendencies that we carry with us to look at life in a certain way, various elements of our personalities that can be traced back to our origins, our upbringing, our parents, our brothers and sisters, possibly our position in our families, we bring all these things to the ministry of the gospel. And with it all, we bring our sins and our sinfulnesses that we possess. And somehow, what we want is that we will be used so that when that very unique time comes, that we mount the pulpit, which is a special place, and we speak to the people of God who are the people of God whom Christ has purchased with his own precious blood. And we talk to them. What we want to happen is that in those moments, the message that is communicated will be one of which it can be said, it was not simply the word of man, but it was in fact the word of God. The Apostle Paul, of course, as you know, when he writes to the Thessalonians, he says, that's what happened. When I came to you, you received the word that I spoke, not simply as the word of men, but as what it really was, the word of God. And that can only occur if that which we are doing during those uniquely significant moments that we deliver ourselves of the message which God has given us is done in a way which is as ethically pure as possible. If in that time span those contaminations that are a part of our person are allowed to operate unchecked, the message that will be given could well be contaminated as well. And so somehow, what we long for as ministers of the gospel and as preachers of the word is that those conditions will be present in our own lives that will make us useful to our Savior. That he will be able to use us in order that we will indeed preach, which you may recall we define the first evening we were together as a unique form of discourse which is biblical and authoritative and apostolic and which is designed to bring about conversion and to stimulate piety and to equip people to serve Jesus Christ. We want to bring something that will enable that to occur. And I believe that when we go to the scripture, we discover that if we are preachers of the gospel, we are obligated to the life of self-discipline. The Apostle Paul was talking about that. In 1 Corinthians 9, he's talking even about beating his body, training as if he were 
in training for a race. There are certain qualities of personality and personhood which are necessary if we are to be effective. I'm thinking, for example, of what we read in Second Peter, the first chapter, which contain words which can be spoken to all Christians, but a fortiori, they can be spoken to preachers. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but if anyone does not have them he's nearsighted and he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. So here the Bible sets up an equation in which certain Christian virtues and graces are put in a context in which it is shown that they are necessary. They must be present if we are to be effective. Now perhaps I should simply insert as a parenthesis here something of which we're all aware and that is this that God can also use very very flawed and marred tools to conduct his work in fact that's really the only reason why we can be used at all as we will see later on as I speak to you tonight but but still the Apostle Paul speaks of a discipline in his life here in Peter we we see this equation and so I'd like to talk about some of the things which it seems to me we as preachers of the gospel should be thinking about because if we are going to be genuine in our proclamation of the word, if our proclamation of the word is to be authentic, if it is to be truly sincere, that cannot be achieved through some contrived mechanism. But we will be sincere only if we are sincere. Our gospel will be authentic only if we ourselves really are authentic Christians. What are some of the things we should be thinking about? I make these suggestions tonight for your consideration. First of all, the matter of call and calling is extremely significant. It is impossible to preach the word of God unless you are called to preach the word of God the sense of call must be overwhelming it is a strange thing the call to preach the gospel there is a sense I suppose in which we would say that any discussion of the call to the ministry of the gospel would have to be placed in the category of abnormal psychology because not everybody has it by any means. I often think that many people that I talk with and that I know, they, 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 they try to understand what it must be like to be called to be a preacher, but I don't think unless they're called themselves to that task, they ever really can. The Apostle Paul describes that here in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, when he talks about the necessity that has been laid upon him. What is involved in the call? Well, it involves certainly an assessment of yourself. Certain gifts must be present, and they are, some of them at least, very obvious gifts. There has to be a certain minimal intellectual capacity certainly among people like ourselves who feel that the ministry demands a certain level of training it's impossible to be a minister unless you are able to do some study and it demands a certain ability to communicate that is important in many ways 
although it's always fascinating to me how many different styles of speech can be employed in good communication. So a person may be a good communicator and still you might never know it, really. First, when you get to know him when he's young, and you might say, well, how can he ever be a good communicator? But he could well be a very good communicator. That, that's involved some way in the call to the ministry. But there are other gifts that are necessary. There are gifts of personality, kindness, and gentleness. If someone came to me who was intellectually superior and who could speak with the tongue of angels but he had no love, I would say to him, I don't think you're called to be a minister of the gospel because I dare say that if you should enter the gospel, though you have some of the gifts, enter the ministry, though you have some of the gifts, you will be behind your ministry a wake of havoc as people try to recover from the way you've treated them. And there are people like that who are gifted, but they are exacerbators. They make every situation worse that they enter. And it is important to evaluate those who say that they are called to the gospel in terms of some of those elements of human personality. But then, of course, with these, there must be a vital, real experience of Jesus Christ. A person should be converted if he's going to be a minister of the gospel. The whole matter of conversion, of course, is, is a difficult one to really talk about, and we tend to come at it from in various ways, depending on our traditions. And there are some who say you should have a time and place that you can point out and say, it was on that day that I was born again. And others say, no, that is not true. And I suppose you could go round and round for a long time on that subject. But the fact of the matter is, it seems to me that if you're going to preach the gospel of grace, you're going to be a preacher. You have to be able to say, there was a time in my life when I really didn't know Christ. And then he came and he captured me. I really don't care what your tradition is, but I don't know how you could really be a preacher of the gospel without being able to say, I realize it may not have been a day or an hour, but it could have been a period of time when the Holy Spirit took a hold of your heart and you, you realized you couldn't go on with those attitudes and those habits. So all of those those too are involved conversion those types of things but then with this this interior growing recognition that God has put his finger upon you there has to be some external verification of the call to the ministry I think we have every reason to be skeptical of those who claim to be called to the ministry of the gospel who seem really never to be able to fit in anywhere and whose call, when they describe it, seems to have come from some, some source, some heavenly source that they have heard but no one else has. And no one has responded to it in any way or suggested that they should be used in some special way within the church. There has to be that recognition on the part of the people of God who have the Spirit of God that here is a person that God wants us to use in the ministry of the gospel. There are many, what I'm saying really is simply this, there are many components to the call and to the ministry, but one thing is true. It has to be real. It has to be actual. It has to be something that has captured your heart and so that you're able to say, sometimes in spite of your frustrations, in spite of the fact that sometimes you feel so unworthy and so ill-equipped to speak the name of Christ, still, you know you have no other choice. Woe to me 
if I do not preach the gospel. We could talk about it for a long time, but I'm not going to anymore. I might just say that some time ago I did write a chapter in a book on the call to the ministry. If any of you would ever like to refer to it, the book is edited by Samuel Logan. And I think it's called Preachers and Preaching. It was published just last year by, I think, Reformed Presbyterian Publishing House. You may have it in your library here. I don't know, but sometime if you were ever really interested in thinking possibly somewhat more about the call of the ministry, there is a chapter in that book that I know of that speaks of it, and it might be of some interest to you. But let me just say this. Don't ever try to be a preacher unless you're sure that God is call you to that task. The second thing that I'd like to talk about this evening is this. If we are called to be preachers of the word, it means that we, therefore, must be in bondage to the source. The source. And what is the source? Well, you know what it is. It's this book right here. The Bible. I know. But how do you look at the Bible when you think about it as the source of your preaching? Sometime I have discovered myself thinking about the Bible so improperly in connection with my preaching. I have realized that I have to use the Bible to preach. But something has happened over the years as I have worked with the Bible and been trained in the Bible, after a while you come to think about the Bible as a collection of texts. See, the Bible has John 3.16 in it, for example. Maybe you ought to preach on John 3.16. That's a good text. And there are many others, and you can tick them off, and they all have designations in the Bible. There is a sense, of course, in which we use the Bible that way to preach the gospel. But when I, I think tonight about what it takes in order to ensure that we will be properly disciplined in our use of the word, it seems to me that what we have to think about as preachers is that the Bible is not really a collection of texts. It is not even simply a book, not even a library made up of many different books. But we must begin to view the Bible as a world, a world, another world. I remember when I was in seminary, I went to Kelvin Seminary, and when we graduated from Kelvin Seminary, we had a sign, a little card, that we had read the whole Bible through all the way. I think back on that, and I think, isn't that absolutely ridiculous? that seminary students had to sign a card to say that they had read the whole Bible all the way through. And then I realized the reason for that was that as seminarians, we were always dealing with pieces of the Bible. We were dealing with texts here or books here or something like that. But a lot of people just never got around to reading the whole Bible through. The Bible is a world, a special world like Watership Down. We were talking about that last evening. I was at Roy Williams' house and somehow the conversation got around to Watership Down. You perhaps know the book. It's a book about rabbits. And when you read Watership Down, you are changed so far as rabbits are concerned. <laughs> you never look at a rabbit again without wondering what that rabbit's thinking where he's going, what he has on his mind. When you read that book, you're just living in another world. Well, this is what a preacher is. A preacher is that link between this decade of this century and another world. The whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and I challenge you tonight, if you're going to be a preacher of the Word, to read it through over and over and over again. If you read ten pages of the Bible every day, you can read the Bible through twice every year. 
takes you about four and a half months to read it through. At least this one of mine, given the pagination in this book. And you should just do that. You should be reading that book through over and over again so that, why, of course, five months ago you read about that. And now you read about it once more. So gradually that this world, really, this world becomes your world. This world is the main world. This is the world where the truth is. And as a preacher, now I don't, I do care what other Christians do with the Bible. If they do is up to them and they have their responsibility. But when you're a preacher of the gospel and you're going to stand in the pulpit, then when you come onto that pulpit, you better not just walk out of your study onto that pulpit, but you better be one coming from that world the world that has been put together through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that means when you stay close to this source, that then you're going to be able to stay close to Him. You know who I mean by Him? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ, you know. He said that to the Pharisees. He said in John 5, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness to me. And he never tired of showing people how the Old Testament applied to him in that, that unique and remarkable seminary after Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven. And he met with his disciples and he taught them and he stood before them. The ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Just think of it. You think of a person who had, would ever have authority in himself Jesus Christ, the ascended Jesus Christ, what did he do? He walked into the classroom of that seminary, he had a Bible, and he showed from the Bible the truth that he wanted his disciples to know. He used the Old Testament for that. Jesus, you meet him on the pages of this book, and it is Jesus, Jesus alone, who is the person that we must present in our preaching, Jesus. That's our message. Our message has to be the Bible, but not just a text here and a text there, but we have to come out of this world which is, is vibrant with the presence of Jesus Christ and completely formed by this world. We have to simply focus in on the message of this person who's the center of this book. As the Apostle Paul talks about it, for example, in 1 Corinthians, again, I read from it before as he talks about this For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks, but to those who are being saved. God's great salvation. When you live in this book, the Bible, when this is the world, that forms your life. You finally begin to see this, this marvelous truth. And I have no explanation for it. But when you bring people this Bible and you represent this Bible, then people are going to be saved. There's no explanation for that. But if you bring this Bible people are going to be saved. And when you hold a law, the crucified Jesus Christ who's at the center of this Bible, people are going to be saved. And people say, now, how can that be? You know, other religions have a God who is revealed in all of his glory and all of his greatness. But at the center of the Christian religion, you have a God who saves people at the point of his humiliation. You have a God on a cross. Just think of it, a God on a cross. We are saved not by God and his power, but we're saved by God and his weakness. We are saved not by God in his glory, but we're saved by God in his shame. 
as he endured the greatest shame that was ever heaped upon any individual. And it was heaped upon Jesus because he who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. And he poured out his, he poured out his wrath on Jesus. And that, that sacrifice and that Jesus Christ is the one who just takes hold of your life when you live in this world. And then when you preach, then you will naturally preach about Christ. And you will naturally preach about the cross. And people will be saved through the words that you speak. So this is the discipline of ours. We speak about the disciplines that we need for the ministry, the discipline of preparation. How do we prepare for the ministry? Well, we learn Greek, we learn Hebrew, we learn biblical theology, we learn dogmatics, we learn philosophical theology, phenomenology of religion. We learn it all. We try to know something about it, and it's all important and it's all useful. But when it comes right down to it, what is necessary is that we are men and we are bound to the Scripture. And this is the world that we live in. So that's the second thing I want to talk about tonight, the necessity of being bound to the source. The third thing I'd like to talk about is this. It seems to me that we can be used by God as ministers of the gospel if we carefully develop a sense of place, a sense of place. By that I mean this. As ministers of the gospel, we must not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We must, when you're called to be a minister, Mothers always love it when their sons are called to be ministers. I don't mind it. And uh, it seems to be such a, an honorable thing when a person is called to be a minister, and on a certain level it is. But the ministry and, and the preaching of the gospel is a very narrow and focused activity. I think one of the reasons ministers get in as much trouble as they do is that often they forget that. That when you're called to be a minister, then you are called to be that. And that's only one thing in the church. It's just one thing. When ministers try to give the impression that they are some kind of superior individual, within the church of Jesus Christ, they, they indicate that they obviously don't really understand what the church of Jesus Christ really is, and they don't understand what they really are. I just turned to the 12th chapter of the book of Corinthians. And this book of Corinthians says very clearly that the church of Jesus Christ is a body. It's a body. And a minister is just a part of that body. Very important part. But so are other people in the body. Very important. A minister is a, a preacher now, is a person with a very specific task that is useful. But our work is doomed to be useless if we don't understand where we fit in and we don't understand that we need the ministry of our brothers and sisters just as much as they need ours. And we have to understand that the ministry we bring to the body of Christ is only one ministry that's being exercised within the body of Christ. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying this here. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And on the contrary, these parts of the body, etc. You know this passage of Scripture here. 
Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. And there are other passages in the scripture which speak of the gifts that, that Christ's Holy Spirit has lavished upon the church. The church is like a, a variegated piece of cloth with all kinds of marvelous strands that have been woven through it. And it all hangs together and becomes a beautiful fabric that brings glory to God. And so a minister has to have a certain, a preacher when he's preaching, may never assume a position of fundamental superiority over against the body of Jesus. Now some people, I've heard people talk this way to me. They've said this to me. Listen, when a minister preaches, a minister is supposed to stand before the people and say, Thus saith the Lord. And you better listen to this now because this is what the Lord says. Now there's a sense, I guess, in which that's true. You, the minister does speak authoritatively. I mentioned that in the definition of preaching. There is an authoritative dimension to the preaching of the word. But the authority is related to the content of his preaching. And as we preach, what we have to do, it seems to me, is make very clear to the people who are listening to us that we're not over here somewhere as some kind of superior Christian who have, have it all together. And from this vantage point, of superior spiritual development we're now going to do them the honor of providing them with the information that they need what we have to make clear to those who listen to us and the only way we can make it clear to them is that we really understand it ourselves and that is this that we with them are desperately in need of the message that we bring when we talk about salvation and when we when we urge people to believe in Christ to be covered by his blood and to be saved we do that as people who themselves understand the necessity of their being washed in the blood of Jesus. What sinners we all are, you see. We're all sinners. We were talking, I was talking with someone today from your faculty. We were talking about the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. Some of you know that chapter very well. The Apostle Paul, in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans, he, he speaks in despair about the fact, he says, the good that I would that I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do talks about that. There have been a lot of people who said, well, you know, that's a discussion, that's a description of the Apostle Paul before he was converted. He couldn't possibly have said that after he was converted. I don't know how they can ever come to that conclusion that he could never have said that after he was converted. Because to me, this is a perfect description of the continuing dynamic that exists within the Christian life. You look at the Apostle Paul. Who, who emerge it, it's fascinating how the Apostle Paul is willing to bear his soul on the pages of the scripture he talks about himself and the way he feels it's, it's beautiful the, the information we have about the interior life of the Apostle Paul and he speaks about the fact that he looks back and he, he says uh, faithful is the saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ died to save sinners of whom I am the worst and Jesus Christ, when he told the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, and he talked about these two people who went into the temple to pray, and he spoke about the Pharisee who came to the front of the temple and said, Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm certainly not like that publican. And the publican said, Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, That man went home justified rather than the other. Isn't it true that every day, a new, every one of us, has to say, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I don't know anything about your sins, those of you who are here. I don't know you people that well anyway, but I don't know anything about your sins. 
but I do know about mine. And I do know that on that great day of days when I stand before the judge of all the earth, that I won't have any reason to look at anybody else because I know that I must be covered by the blood of Jesus. And so we must always speak out of a of an experience of God's grace. And we must understand that the people to whom we're speaking, they need the gospel desperately. Indeed. But we need the gospel desperately too. We need it absolutely desperately. And I think it's it's when you when you taste Psalm 46, I think, Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good when you taste the flavor, the marvelous flavor of Christianity, the flavor of God's great salvation. And when you come into the pulpit with that flavor in your person and you realize that you have been saved through the blood of Jesus and you are no different from anyone who is before you, then taking your place within the... I'm talking about the cultivation of sense of place. You may, Maybe you've forgotten that's really the point I'm making now. But the cultivation of sense of place. On the one hand, we recognize that our calling is just one within the church. And on the other hand, we recognize that we are just like everyone else to whom we speak. And so we speak out of an experience of the glory of God's greatness ourselves and then finally this it seems to me that we preach the gospel as we become more and more aware of that great great paradox that relates to the preaching of the word of God and so far as I know it doesn't relate to anything else that people do. And the paradox is this. I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul again. We prepare for the ministry. We assess our gifts. We look at our talents and all of that. And we try to bring it all together and we try to use it. All of that. But our God has a way of mocking our strength and using our weaknesses. And the mystery of the gospel and of the ministry and of preaching the gospel is that you really are used by God best when you're weakest yourself. And I'm looking here at the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians and there the Apostle Paul talks about his ecstatic experiences as he came in contact with paradise itself and he was just swept away by the beauty and the wonder of it. And then he speaks about this thorn in his flesh. You know that. To keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations the thorn was given to me, thorn in my flesh, messenger of Satan to torment me Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says this now, Therefore, I will boast most gladly in my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. I delight in weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And I know I've talked to some of you preachers of the gospel at this conference, and you've come to me and you've said, hey, what do you do when you, when you go through these, these terrible experiences in your life and you don't think you can go on and you're just beaten down? What do you do? Well, the fascinating thing is 
that when we're the weakest and when we realize how frail we are sometime when we've been disgraced sometimes things can happen in our families a lot of you people here tonight you're preachers in the middle years you've had things happen in your families you have things happen in your family sometime and you say how can I go on and this happened right in my own family right in public people know about it in my community it happened to me I'm the preacher and you feel so small and so disgraced and you can be ill you can have a serious illness and then all of a sudden you discover well listen listen don't you know that's the way it is don't you know this is what you're preaching you're preaching about grace grace that heals broken discouraged disgraced people and that's why I've arranged your life to make sure that you discover what it's like yourself because I want to use you this way not in terms of your strengths but in terms of your weaknesses and that's an interesting thing about the ministry that's why you don't really have to be afraid when you when you move forward into your ministerial activities you can know look whatever happens to me whatever I have to go through whatever I have to go through this great God that I serve is going to be able to use me if I just keep surrender to him and I keep following him and I want to do his will so I think God can use us as we discipline ourselves and we put ourselves at his disposal and we think about some of the things that I talked about with you tonight we think about our call we think about the fact that we have to be bound to the word of God as we remember that we always have to have the proper understanding of ourselves in relationship to the rest of the church and as we understand that God will be able to use us even when we're weak as weak can be we find ourselves in that strange place where we boast because of our weakness. I want to close tonight with a kind of an odd thought which I have been thinking about lately and maybe doesn't seem all that significant to you, but I got thinking the other day and I thought, you know, I don't think that there's going to be any preachers in heaven. I'll tell you what I mean by that. <laughs> what I mean is this what I mean is this I think that there are going to be some other human activities that are going to be expressed in that new creation the reason I say that is this before the fall when God created this world of his and he looked at it and he said that is good it's good and it is good when you look at the way he put the world together the complexity of it the beauty of it the lavishness of it the glory of it no wonder he said that is good it's so good now, if God created the world that way, and then, you know, he put man right in the middle of the garden, and he said, I'm going to give you a job to do. I want you to dress this garden. I want you to take care of it, work in this beautiful place. That's before sin, you know. This was, no one had fallen into sin. God said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to work in this creation of mine. And then sometime I think, you know, if I were a farmer, I think maybe when I die and go to heaven, God is going to say to me, I want you to work in this creation, this new creation, the new heavens 
and the new earth with all of their beauty I want you to work in it but you know in that new creation there's nobody going to need any preachers anymore nobody you only need preachers in this world because in the new heavens and the new earth everybody is going to be seeing Jesus and worshiping him and praising him all the time and I wonder what people like us are going to be doing then <laughs> but I do know this I do know this that right now in this world the job that we have to do is the greatest privilege that you can ever have showing people Jesus Christ. Amen.